Hi, everybody. You're listening very quietly, but I know you're not here to hear me talk, so I will be brief and to the point. I'm going to introduce three things to you in rapid succession, starting broadest and most abstract and ending on the human level and the concrete level. First and foremost, the Humanities Forum, of which you are now partaking. This is an opportunity for members of the Providence College community to engage regularly in the intellectual life outside of the classroom, to deepen their appreciation of the humanities, and to explore diverse perspectives from on and off campus. These happen most Fridays right here in this room, but not always on Friday, um, with receptions following in the great room down the hall. And they bring in faculty from around the country to talk on a variety of issues. And even if they're not on Friday, they're always very interesting. And we're glad that you're here. Having said that nice thing, let me play bad cop for a minute and say that I would, I would urge you to put away your laptops during the talk. I know that some of you are, are capitalizing on like, OK, I have a response paper, so I'm going to respond in real time like a, like a you know, tweeting the news kind of thing. And I think, you know, instead, why don't you, out of respect for our guests, you know, and, and for your own sort of like undivided attention, just close that screen, let the talk wash over you, take notes by hand, if you will, and then whip out your response paper afterwards. And that's the way to go. Um, thing number two that I need to introduce is the Frederick Douglass Project, which is an initiative of the Humanities Program. And it's based on the idea that for a society to be free and to remain free, you need to have citizens who can think and speak clearly and who can argue ideas persuasively and well. So we aim to do that by hosting events like this one, um, by teaching them classes on persuasion, and also by organizing writing contests and debates. There will be a lot of that going on in the spring. I hope you keep your eyes out for it and participate in the Frederick Douglass Project. And it's made possible by generous funding from the Jack Miller Center, um, who are also the sponsors of today's talk. Okay. Now, third and finally, our talk today will be with Professor Eric Adler, who's sitting over here to my right, your left. He's, the prof he's a professor and the chair of the Classics Department at the University of Maryland, and previously taught at Connecticut College. He grew up, much like many of you did, in the Boston area, and completed his PhD in classical studies at Duke. He's an expert on Roman historiography, Latin prose, the History of Classical Scholarship and the History of the Humanities. His most recent book is entitled The Battle of the Classics, How a 19th Century Debate Can Save the Humanities Today. And he's going to be, he's thinking about, and he's going to be asking questions which all of you as students in Civ courses maybe have asked yourselves about Civ, such as, why does this program exist? What is it good for? How should it be organized? How should it be designed? Now, if that's not enough to whet your appetite, allow me to read you this quote from Anonymous from Latin 201 on ratemyprofessor.com. Eric Adler is the best professor I've ever had. I have now taken three classes with him and hope to take more in the future. He explains things in a way that is easy to understand and he takes the time to help you. He is also super funny and is just a great human being. So without further ado, Super funny, great human being, Eric Adler. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. People can hear me, I'm sure. Yeah, good. Um, the first time rape my professor has ever been used uh, to introduce me, so there's, there's something there. Thank you. Uh, and for the invitation also to speak at Providence College, uh, I can't thank Professor Bernoft and the Frederick Douglass Project enough for uh, the kind invitation and also the opportunity to speak at Providence College, a place I visited for the first time today. Um, it's a delight for me to be here, and I say this as uh, Professor Bernoff mentioned, a native of the Boston suburbs. We used to travel to Providence at least once per year to visit relatives. Uh, this would coincide with a visit to a restaurant called Cello's, which I don't know if there's, uh, which was thriving. We all sort of loved it. Um, we haven't gone there. I assume dinner is not at Cello's tonight, but nevertheless. And then we would also marvel at how 
the drivers on 95 in Providence were magically worse than the drivers in Boston, which was seemingly the only time that that has ever come up. When you see someone going 90 miles an hour on 95, just veering in and out of various lanes, you just think, my God, if only I were in Boston, I'd be so much safer. Um, the title of my talk today is, What Do the Humanities Do? And I'm going to argue that defenders of the modern humanities, in order for their disciplines to survive and to thrive on contemporary college campuses, must underscore the unique contributions of the humanities to a properly educated person. As you'll see, my perspective is going to implicitly support the sort of core curriculum that plays a part at Pro in Providence College's general education program, although I'll ultimately vouch for a, an omnicultural approach to a humanistic education and to a humanistic core education today. Since the, my topic this afternoon dovetails with my latest book, The Battle of the Classics, How a 19th Century Debate Can Save the Humanities Today, uh, I'm going to be offering a kind of precis of that book as a means to plump for the necessity of the humanities for any educated person. My presentation should take me around 30 minutes. Uh, I'll then be happy to answer any questions you may have. Professor Bernhoft informed me that I'd have about 30 to 35 minutes for my lecture. I thought it would be useful for me to be concise. I'm sure you'll delight in that, even if I'm not funny. Um, so we can have a longer conversation. Um, ever since my book, The Battle of the Classics, which came out in 2020, ever since it appeared in print, um, um, I have noted that mine is a subject on which people tend to have lots of opinions. And so I look forward to those opinions and to a conversation after about my 30 minutes of uh, a spiel today. Um, my book, The Battle of the Classics, is about the distinctive value of the humanities and how we can best safeguard the place of the humanities on, in our society and in our higher education. As you're probably well aware, the humanities aren't faring well on contemporary college campuses. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, American newspapers and magazines seem to chime in each week with more examples of the impending demise of various humanistic disciplines, such as English or philosophy or German and the classics. Various universities and colleges across the nation have shuttered humanities programs. In 2020, Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin, for example, announced the discontinuation of its classics, philosophy, and great ideas majors. Similarly, in the same year, Illinois Wesleyan University disclosed the shuttering of its classics department and slated programs in religion, French, and Italian for the chopping block. The University of Kansas, in early 2021, announced its plans to eliminate its humanities program and undergraduate degrees in humanities and in visual arts education. With both a post-COVID post, post fiscal crisis and demographic shifts looming on the horizon, many faculty members fear that such closures are just the tip of the iceberg. In this context, the humanities seem to be fighting for their very survival in American higher education. In response to this looming crisis, scholars have fought back. Not only scholars who teach the humanities, but also those who are more generally supportive of a broad approach to higher learning. In my book, I join their ranks, but I also disagree profoundly with most recent efforts to show why the humanities matter and why they must play a foundational role in the education of all Americans. My sense is that many contemporary defenders of the humanities, although their hearts are in the right places, uh, provide impoverished answers to the question, what do the humanities do? They provide such impoverished answers to that important question, I contend, because their apologetics are disconnected from the history of the human humanities, or the history of humanism, as a pedagogical movement and as a philosophy of life since antiquity. The first chapter of my book examines many examples of contemporary apologetics for the humanities to determine whether they provide the best defenses of the humanities that we can muster. 
the chapter notes that most recent defenses of the humanities are not really defenses of the humanities per se. Rather, they overwhelmingly center on the humanities' purported ability to inculcate various skills in students. The skill most often vouched for by contemporary defenders of the humanities is something called critical thinking. In her book from 2010, uh, Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, for example, the philosopher Martha Nussbaum argued that the humanities are vital to education because they, quote, vigorously promote critical thinking, the skills and courage it requires to raise a dissenting voice, end quote. Similarly, in his book from 2014, The Humanities Crisis and the Future of Literary Studies, the professor of English literature, Paul Jay, argued that American college students should be introduced to postmodern literary theory because, quote, courses putting a stress on critical theories and disciplinary methodologies are some of the best ones we have for teaching critical thinking, end quote. Although apologists for the humanities who center their case on critical thinking are obviously well-intentioned, one can note many problems with this line of defense. First, those who base their case on critical thinking seldom define what the term critical thinking actually means. As Victor Farrell Jr., an emeritus president of Beloit College, noted in his book from 2011, Liberal Arts at the Brink, quote, there are few college presidents and admissions officers who do not routinely feature critical thinking in their public utterances. But what exactly is critical thinking? How does it differ from plain old good thinking?" End quote. Given the crucial importance of critical thinking to contemporary defenses of the humanities, it is striking that few apologists would feel the need to unpack and explain what this concept is. Why would defenders allow their arguments to hinge on a term sufficiently nebulous that the professor of English literature, Stanley Fish, could dismiss critical thinking as, quote, a phrase without content, end quote. And Fish is not alone in his criticisms of the concept of critical thinking. Some education experts question its validity and its pedagogical value. Moreover, to convince skeptics that humanistic disciplines must be retained in higher education, it seems crucial to demonstrate that the humanities provide something that other disciplines do not provide. Yet it is far from certain that critical thinking, whatever that means, is the sole domain of the contemporary humanities. Can one earnestly contend that students don't learn how to think critically by studying, say, mathematics or biology or political science? Thus, Farrell rightly wondered, quote, whatever critical thinking may be, why is it more likely to be learned by studying English literature or philosophy than business management? Why would one suppose that English literature or philosophy professors are more likely to inculcate critical thinking in their students than business administration professors, end quote. Indeed, if you ask professors of, say, engineering or sociology or nursing or physics, pretty much all of them will tell you that their classes increase their students' abilities in the realm of critical thinking. We can point to another important downside associated with justifying the humanities on the basis of critical thinking. As it turns out, this shortcoming plagues all such skills-based arguments for the humanities. The problem is that recent defenders of the humanities regularly appeal to the authority of social scientists to validate their conclusions about the humanities as conduits for promoting desirable skill sets. Social scientists, unlike humanists after all, can test empirically which subjects most effectively promote critical thinking, however they define it. As a result, skills-based defenses implicitly suggest the social sciences and not the humanities have the proper tools to assess value. If only an experiment could demonstrate the true value of Shakespeare, they say, then the humanistic disciplines could prove their worth. Thus, humanists must turn to social scientists to validate their impressions. Humanists, apparently lacking any useful means to judge the worthiness of their subject matter, must play the social scientist's game. By doing so, they demonstrate the superior value of the social sciences, and they also signal that humanists lack any intrinsic ability to evaluate quality. 
How valuable can the humanities disciplines be if they cannot even credibly vouch for their importance on their own terms? The dangers of hitching one's wagon to social scientific justifications for the humanities should appear obvious. What happens when a group of social scientists conducts a study that shows, say, engineering majors vastly outperforming humanities majors in some skill that they associate with collegiate learning? If the, human, if the humanities must live by the social sciences, they're going to die by the social sciences too. In short, outsourcing claims about the value of your discipline is a risky business. This is especially an important conclusion in the context of American higher education, since the dominant approach to the college curriculum in the United States forces disciplines to fight against one another for resources and increasingly for survival. Why would humanists want to appeal to the authority of their curricular opponents in an attempt to defend the value of their subject matter? And if social scientists cast doubt on the humanities as incubators of various valuable aptitudes, you can presume that humanists will do a poor job attempting to debunk those conclusions. After all, humanists already agreed to play by the social scientists' rules. Through this means, they've set themselves up for failure. Consequently, in my book, even though I recognize the occasional necessity of stressing the humanities as conduits for the creation of job-ready skills, I believe that this is not the best way to vouch for the importance of the humanities. I further contend that an over-reliance on skills-based justifications will never encourage a genuine revival of the humanities on American college campuses. In opposition to the skills-based approach that dominates recent defenses of the humanities, my book seeks to provide a historically informed and substance-based defense for the humanities instead. To do so, it looks back in American educational history to a time when debates over the role of the humanities in higher education took central stage. In the late 19th, and early 20th centuries, American higher education witnessed what historians of higher education have long labeled the battle of the classics. At this time, much intellectual energy in the nation was expended on attacks on and defenses of the role of the humanities in US higher learning. And at that time, the late 19th century into the early 20th century, the humanities were still commonly conceived of as the classical humanities. The prominent disputes associated with the Battle of the Classics focused on elite campuses, which in the 19th century and today received the most attention from the American press and the American public. Indeed, sundry newspapers and journals of the day focused on these disputes, which appear to have caught the attention of the American reading public. Traditionalists in the Battle of the Classics hoped to retain the classical languages, Latin and Greek, in many cases still synonymous with the humanities as the pedagogical core of higher education in the United States. That's what they wanted. They wanted require, to maintain required Latin and Greek in the college curriculum. Um, their opponents, who were often called modernists by contrast, aimed to end curricular prescription and the dominance of Latin and ancient Greek in the American colleges. My book contends that we can learn today much from the arguments uh, from the late 19th and early 20th century in the Battle of the Classics that will be directly applicable to our situation in attempting to defend the modern humanities today. Later chapters in the book analyze various attention-grabbing debates over the role of the classical humanities during the course of the Battle of the Classics. They argue that traditionalistic defenders of the classical humanities in the 19th and early 20th centuries made the exact same error that defenders of the modern humanities are making today. These 19th and early 20th century defenders overwhelmingly based their case for the classical humanities on skills. More specifically, traditionalists during the Battle of the Classics maintained that Latin and ancient Greek must remain central parts of the US college curriculum because these subjects were supposedly the best inculcators of something they called mental discipline. Proponents of mental discipline theory 
attempted to connect the liberal arts tradition to so-called faculty psychology. Influenced by Scottish common sense philosophy, they viewed the mind through the metaphor of a muscle. Just as one needs to exercise one's body in order to grow strong, one must also exercise one's mind in order to increase the faculties of the intellect, the will, and the sensibilities. To many traditionalists during the Battle of the Classics, the classical languages must remain prescribed elements of the curriculum for all students because they supposedly offered the most effective form of mental gymnastics. It did not take long for the modernists to debunk that claim. Indeed, as various social scientists noted at the time, the traditionalists presented scarcely any proof that studying the ancient languages was more intellectually taxing than studying, say, chemistry or German. To make matters worse, by stressing the cardinal importance of mental discipline, the traditionalists had unwittingly made social scientists the arbiters of education's value. Thus, for example, when the psychologist Edward L. Thorndike reported on a study that he conducted of American high school students in which he demonstrated that those who had studied Latin scarcely gained more general intelligence, as he called it, than those who had taken stenography classes, the traditionalistic supporters of the classical languages had no answer. This is of cardinal importance for defenders of the modern humanities to understand today because as the historian of education, David Potts, has correctly stressed, critical thinking is mental discipline's, quote, conceptual successor, end quote. Our current apologetics for the modern humanistic disciplines, which routinely genuflect to critical thinking and other kindred skills, suffer from the same flaws detectable in the traditionalistic defenses of the classical humanities in the context of the battle the classics. Such flaws should be obvious to astute students of the humanistic tradition. Indeed, the Italian humanists who reshaped and reinvigorated the classical humanities in the early Renaissance had revolted against the skills-focused scholasticism that was then regnant in European higher education. The scholastics had placed paramount value on the techniques associated with syllogistic reasoning. It was in opposition to this spirit that Italian humanists such as Leonardo Bruni advocated a curriculum based on the masterworks of ancient Greek and Latin literature. To Bruni and his fellow humanists from the Renaissance, such masterworks had to be encountered by all students in their original languages because they could perfect a student's character and a student's style. The Renaissance humanists perceived that perfecting one's character was the essential goal of education. They thus supported a curriculum of substance, works of great wisdom that can spur on self-reflection and self-improvement in the young. The Renaissance humanist focus on a curriculum of substance also mirrors in important respects ancient approaches to the humanities. In regard to their literary side, Ancient Greek and Roman elite education focused on exposure to particular humanities content. Thus, such studies hinged on a canon of masterworks, Homer's Iliad and eventually Virgil's Aeneid first among them. Similarly, Renaissance humanists recommended the works of Homer and Cicero and Virgil and Livy and Tacitus among others. Importantly, the classical curriculum desirable to the Renaissance humanists is rightly seen as too narrow to meet the intellectual and moral needs of the present. One may say the same, I think, about the so-called great books tradition, which sired many required collegiate courses devoted to Western civilization in mid 20th century America, after the failures of the traditionalists to defend the old prescribed classical curriculum during the Battle of the Classics. In an age of decolonizing the curriculum, educators understandably balk at curricular approaches that appear insufficiently inclusive. How then can humanists defend a substance-based approach to the modern humanities while steering clear of the Western triumphalism that is often associated with the great books? <clears throat> 
Here, I think it's instructive to focus on a crucial figure in the humanistic tradition in America who wrote at the tail end of the Battle of the Classics and who can, I think, help point a way forward. Irving Babbitt, who lived from 1865 until 1933, was a classically trained professor of French and comparative literature at Harvard University. Babbitt provided the strongest defense of the classical and the modern humanities in his era. In opposition to the skills-based apologetics for the humanities of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Babbitt rekindled a genuinely humanistic approach to the study of literature. When properly studied, Babbitt maintained, the humanities should enable people to live up to their higher potentialities and thereby lead sounder and happier lives. Indeed, Babbitt's attempt to encapsulate humanist wisdom from the past enabled him to proffer a fuller philosophical description of the movement as a way of life. Far more specifically than did his Renaissance predecessors, Babbitt explained the goals and values associated with a humanistic education. In accordance to, with what he took to be much Greek, Roman, Christian, Hindu, and Buddhist thought, Babbitt contended that all true humanists have at least implicitly stressed the duality of human nature. To Babbitt, human beings possess both impulsive desires, what the philosopher Henri Bergson called the elan vital, and also the ability to restrain or affirm these desires, what Babbitt called the frame vital, and he also called it the inner check, and he also called it the higher will. While the term inner check confusingly suggests pure restraint, in Babbitt's view, it serves more as a means of calibrating moral life with both a restraining and an affirming component. With a nod to Diderot, Babbitt referred to the struggle between one's impulsive desires and one's inner check as the civil war in the cave. And he believed that a humanistic education must present students with works of great profundity and insight that engage students' imaginations. Such works, he believed, would enable them to strengthen the inner check on their longings, and through such means, they might lead sounder, but also happier lives. Unfortunately, thought Babbitt, the modernists in the Battle of the Classics had abandoned that conception of education, and thereby, they had abandoned humanism. As far as he was concerned, modern American higher education had traded in its erstwhile commitment to humanism for a short-sighted, all-encompassing devotion to what Babbitt called humanitarianism, although I think it would be better to call it pseudo-humanitarianism because Babbitt did not oppose genuine humanitarianism. He merely thought that a lot of what masquerades as humanitarian is in fact not really humanitarian. Babbitt identified two types of so-called humanitarianism that, in the absence of a humanist counterweight, were together destroying higher learning in the United States. He called the first scientific naturalism, and he identified it with Francis Bacon. He called the second sentimental naturalism, and he identified it with Jean-Jacques Rousseau as the most powerful advocate of romanticism. Like the Romantics more generally, Rousseau denied the duality of human nature. He believed that human beings were intrinsically good and that society and its institutions had corrupted them. Thus, sentimental naturalists such as Rousseau preached the cultivation of one's innate impulses. Babbitt viewed Rousseau as the intellectual inspiration for the elective curriculum championed by the modernists during the Battle of the Classics. The elective system, which remains with us today in slightly modified form, allows students to choose all of their own courses. About this scheme, Babbitt wrote in his first book from 1908, a book called Literature in the American College, Essays in Defense of the Humanities, he wrote the following, quote, there is no general norm, no law for man, as the humanist believed, with reference to which indiv the individual should select his courses. He should make his selection entirely with reference to his own temperament and its supposedly unique requirements. The wisdom of all the ages is to be not as compared with the inclination of a sophomore, end quote. To the sentimental naturalist, with his rosy impression of human nature, there was no need for young people to improve their characters because human beings were by nature good. Thus, thought Babbitt, 
Scientific naturalists, following the path of Francis Bacon, could eschew the goal of character development in favor of the false path of gaining power over the natural world. By achieving dominion strictly over things, Babbitt feared, scientific naturalists of necessity lost control over themselves. Naturalists, whether of the sentimental or utilitarian variety, denied the civil war in the cave, replacing it with a different outer militancy, a war between human being and society. But without regard for personal improvement through the cultivation of one's higher will, Babbitt feared that supposed humanitarianism would actually unleash horrors on the world. The contemporary choose-your-own-adventure curriculum promotes the message that discipline-specific skills are the lone attainments of an educated person. This is not a curriculum that will allow humanism to thrive. Moreover, Babbitt stressed that such a curricular approach is based on an appealing but ultimately unsound foundation that people can rightly avoid the goal of self-improvement in favor of turning their attention to improving the world. To Babbitt, the complete replacement of humanism with supposed humanitarianism provides a recipe for civilizational disaster. An approach to education such as our own, which casts away humanism, is likely to create what Babbitt called, quote, efficient megalomaniacs. Indeed, our current generation of Silicon Valley tech giants, certain that their inventions will make the world a better place, even though these, pardon me, even though these inventions appear to increase depression and anxiety among their users, provides ample warning about the threat posed by an amoral approach to higher learning that avoids the crucial role of character development. While underscoring the cardinal importance of character formation in education, Babbitt also managed greatly to broaden the humanistic tradition, to allow it to look far beyond its classical and even its Western origins. He did so by stressing what he called the platonic problem of the one and the many. For Plato, the one and the many amounted to a metaphysical problem. In the early dialogues, Plato wondered, what is the one thing common to all, say, pious actions, which makes them pious? Babbitt, however, transferred the problem of the one and the many to the human soul. Uh, uh, human beings, Babbitt noted, are simultaneously all different and all the same. As such, all human traditions, Babbitt posited, have contributed to what he called the wisdom of the ages a nucleus of universal human experience that could help us determine salubrious standards for living a good life. In his writings, for example, Babbitt, who had studied Sanskrit and Pali at the Sorbonne and at Harvard, regularly included insights that he attributed to such non-Western humanists, as he called them, as Confucius and Buddha. For example, in his magnum opus from 1919, Rousseau and Romanticism, Babbitt noted that, quote, the, the experience of the Far East completes and confirms in a most interesting way that of the Occident. We can scarcely afford to neglect it if we hope to work out a truly ecumenical wisdom to oppose the sinister one-sidedness of our current naturalism, end quote. Babbitt implicitly demonstrated that a proper approach to the humanities should center around the study of global masterworks. After all, works of deep intellectual, aesthetic, and moral significance are linked to a rich variety of human civilizations, past and present. From such works, we can attempt to discover whether there is a central core of human wisdom across the ages from manifold traditions that can help us grapple with the best ways to live. Although his educational ideas are not immune to criticism, and require updating to fit the social and pedagogical needs of the present, Babbitt was well ahead of his time in his genuine, intellectually and morally serious and non-tokenizing approach to inclusivity. In the final chapter of my book, I attempt to use Babbitt's philosophical foundation as a springboard for a novel, yet historically informed, omnicultural approach to the study and teaching of the humanities. I stress that in order to, th uh, to thrive, pardon me, in or let me say that again. I stress that in order to thrive, the humanities need to do something that other disciplines in the contemporary academy do not do. That thing, 
is humanism. Many other disciplines in contemporary American education concern themselves with improving the material conditions of life. The humanist job is the crucial balancing work of humanism, the improving of the self. Bereft of the humanities, our schools and universities accomplish only half of what they should. After all, as Babbitt noted over a century ago, we cannot improve the world if we cannot improve ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be very happy to take questions. One of the things we like to do at the Humanities Forum is have a student ask the first question, or at least give the floor to the student for a first question. So, you got one? All right, and as, wait for the, uh, the mic before you talk, because we're capturing this all on film. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I was wondering, um, one of the main theses that I sort of interpreted from this talk was the role of humanities in self-improvement and teaching that to students. Um, this being a Catholic school, um, I was wondering uh, if you thought that a education about theology or um, related subjects would have a similar role, or if not, what role that would have in a holistic education. Thank you, it's a great question. I will say straight up that I am not Catholic, so uh, my answer to this will be less informed than others who happen to be in the room. Um, I come from a different tradition and also educationally from a different tradition as well. Um, but I do think that, more broadly speaking, that any kind of religious education is going to end up dovetailing with some of the themes, the kind of humanistic themes that I'm talking about in, in, in my lecture today. Um, and so it's certainly the case that there's going to be interplay. I would note also, and I had a, a, a discussion about the core curriculum here beforehand, that theology plays a role in that, that kind of humanistic core as well. So I think that the people who made up that core curriculum at Providence College are aware of the overspill between those two things. It does seem to me also that if you're going to go for uh, to an institution of Catholic higher learning that it have, should have a stronger Catholic component than from other religious traditions. I mean, why else would you, why else does Providence College exist if it doesn't actually have a, a, a focus on Catholic traditions? I don't think it would be hurtful, however, and I'm certain that this would probably happen in one's education at Providence as well, to focus some attention on other religious traditions, both to see where there are differences between those religious traditions, but to me, actually, maybe more importantly, where are there are similarities. This might also help with a sense of ecumenism in our culture more generally, which is badly needed, but also may clue into something that I talked about in my lecture, which is the idea that if different traditions have similar views in some respects on the way you ought to live your life, that suggests that human beings from very different circumstances have ultimately hit on similar insights into the meaning of life and how to live a good life. That seems like something we ought to take very important, uh, importantly. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Berard from Providence College English Department. I have two points. The first question I have is uh, if you have, say, for example, the 19th century classical humanists, and then they fell prey, as you say, to what you described as mental gymnastics, it would seem that that education that they had failed them, or their ability to follow that education failed them. Mm -hmm. So if they can't, drawing upon the tradition of the ancients, defend their own tradition, yeah. then it sounds as though that project, although I believe in it, is somehow failing them. Right. Uh, my second point goes to the solution that you're describing, which is the global, or the global humanities, or the global, global studies in a sense, world, world history, world literature, world civilization. I think, if we're to be honest, even trying to teach Western Civ today, trying to take into history, literature, philosophy, we have to make a lot of generalizations, and we often find ourselves not necessarily doing justice to the cultures, to, to, to what they're doing. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we have that problem in Western Civ, as we teach it today, yep. 
how much more magnified will that problem be? And also, going to the second point of that, what if, if we are really self-critical and honest with ourselves, maybe we, as being trained in one tradition to focus as PhDs in one specific area, maybe we don't have the skill set, the experience, the knowledge to, to do justice to a text, mm -hmm. uh, let alone trying to, to have this wide range of coverage. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for those uh, important points. First, I would say about the first, let me take the first one first. Um, it is always the case, I think, that some sort of educational tradition of any sort, whether it's humanism or anything else, can kind of veer off course and people can end up supporting it for very different reasons from what its founders supported. So if you look at what Cicero has to say about what he calls the Studia Humanitatis or what Leonardo Bruno say about the Studia Humanitatis, very different from mental gymnastics. I mean, you really kind of couldn't get there from there, right? Um, I do think that in the circumstances of the Battle of the Classics and early American higher education more generally, there were some structural and pragmatic reasons why that education was likely not to lead to the kind of flourishing of humanism that might have originally been envisioned um, uh, earlier on. One of them is that, and it's hard to imagine this because American higher education was so different before the Civil War uh, from what it is today, is that the vast majority of teachers in American higher education prior to the Civil War were tutors or college presidents themselves who had virtually no, if any, um, graduate education at all. In many cases, they were tutors who had only recently finished the college curriculum themselves. And so as a result, they weren't very good teachers. They didn't have much advanced knowledge. So what they did in regard to their teaching of Latin and Greek is they turned them into kind of grueling recitation sections in which people had to stand up and kind of give their forms and so forth, and maybe they get slapped on the wrist if they weren't able to do so reasonably. So the argument they came up with about mental discipline made sense in that kind of pedagogical context in which it would have been very hard to believe that those kinds of classes were really leading people to the promised land of what the good life was. It was mostly grammar, sort of gerund grinding, basically. And if that's what you're offering, well, mental gymnastics is kind of all you've got, right? So we find ourselves in a very different sort of pedagogical situation, which has its own challenges, but thankfully doesn't have those challenges associated with it. And I do think that that makes things easier uh, for us. As far as the second question is concerned, this gets to the more general concern about dilettantism, right? That we could be teaching these kinds of classes and people kind of don't know very much about what they're talking about and so forth, and there can be a lot of spitballing, and especially given the nature of graduate education in this country, people can feel very uncomfortable. You know, here I go, I'm gonna talk about the Bhagavad Gita. I was trained in Racine, but I'm gonna, suddenly gonna talk about this. This is something that makes people nervous. Now, there are some ways to get away from that, I think, pragmatically speaking, so that at Columbia University, they have a famous core curriculum, and one thing they do is that they have a session each week for the teachers of the core, and one person ends up being an expert on the text that's going to be taught that week, and that person delivers a lecture and answers questions to the other professors who are gonna be teaching that to give some vital context. Here's some things you should point out. Here's some historical context you need to know, and so forth. It's not gonna be the same as an expert on everything, but it's gonna be better than nothing, I think. So that's number one. Number two, I would say, I'm much less concerned about dilettantism than I am in the reverse. One thing that is really crucial to education in the West, starting really with Aristotle as far as what's written, is the idea of well-roundedness. That we want people who are liberally educated to be well-rounded people. Right? Now, what do you see if you go to a, a college curriculum and, and college professors today? You see general education curriculum in which students get to pick and choose the distribution requirements, pick a humanities class, it doesn't matter which one and so forth, and those tend to be taught by the narrowest experts on the smallest topics that they're going to be teaching in the class itself. So the idea is that if you take multiple classes with the narrowest experts on small topics, somehow you will be well-rounded in a way that none of the professors who are your teachers are actually well-rounded. So I don't think under those circumstances we're actually delivering something that's crucial to the humanistic tradition, but also crucial to the liberal arts from antiquity moving forward. I think that's much more of a problem than the reverse of kind of spitballing, which can happen even when people are well-trained 
Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, it's been a long time since I've heard someone talk about Irving Babbitt, so that was uh, pleasant to hear. Um, What's the last time you heard someone? <laughs> My question went, it picks up on this idea of well-roundedness. So I agree with the concerns about skills-based approaches to, to advocating for the humanities. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wonder, not about the principles, but about the effectiveness of a, de a defense of the humanities that's based on some approach to character education, mm -hmm. when contemporary universities are plagued by lots of disagreement about right, moral character and uh, just the question about normativity in general. And so well-roundedness sometimes kind of pops in as the, the via media between this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just skills-based learning, right? but we're not proffering any particular ideal of what a well-educated person or a, a good citizen looks like, we're just presenting you an array of options, right? So I'm just wondering where that kind of defense of the humanities uh, falls into the schema that you're developing here. Yeah, I, so uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think it gets to something that's really important. The last time I delivered something akin to this lecture, a student got up and said, you know, I really don't want my professors just hectoring me about how I should live my life. You know, and the, implicitly was, I'm not so sure that these people know very well about how they should live their lives, let alone mine, which I understand. To me, and I think actually to Babbitt as well, um, the kind of education he's talking about and the kind of education that I'm talking about is one in which the student and professor are together seekers looking at texts that are profoundly, have been seen as profoundly important to human beings from the past and in the present for how they ought to live their lives. But that the ultimate decisions that they make about things, um, that's up to them, right? So I don't want a dogmatic teaching in which everyone is going to be an Aristotelian by the time they leave the class and everything else is just awful and you shouldn't have anything to do with it, right? In any way, shape, or form. You, it may turn out that when you read some of these great texts that you totally reject them, that a student may completely reject them or transcend them in some way, see that some things are valuable and other things aren't and so forth. That's all up to the student, him or herself. And I think that the, the professor should be a guide but actually should not be dogmatic in forcing a particular worldview on the students. I don't think it really works, frankly, even if one does that. So I guess I'm a little bit more loosey-goosey and I think Babbitt is as well. So the idea that these texts are inspiring and very valuable for students to do the work that they need to do to figure out the answers to life's great questions for themselves. And a professor can be a guide and a help for that, but the professor should not be dogmatically asserting what the good life actually is for them. Uh, thank you for coming. but. When you say the good life, how what are what are the concerns about the idea of the good life coming from one region of the world majorly? Because most of the texts that we are reading are from um, like Europe and Greece, and how can we better make syllabi that reflect the good life in terms of the entire world and universal? Yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, Babbitt offers a kind of version of this. Unfortunately, Babbitt was much more focused on what we would now call the Far East um, and on Western Europe than on other traditions, but I do think that he implicitly points a way forward for those who are interested in a m even broader, more ecumenical look at things. And I think one way of doing so is to look at various traditions. I mean, you obviously, in a four-year college curriculum, you cannot be representative of every tradition. That's impossible. But I do think that it would be incumbent on uh, professors uh, in a humanistic core to come up with a variety of texts from a variety of different cultures that have been seen by those cultures as especially insightful into the questions of the meaning of life and various other questions of human existence. What is justice? What is, what is the truth? And so forth, right? Um, there's always, always more, there's a lifetime of reading you can do in addition to that, but I think that coming up with some from various traditions would allow students both to see similarities, correspondences in traditions, and also differences in traditions as well. At the end of my book, um, which is available at all fine bookstores, I, I say that, but I'm, I'm actually not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that there are fine bookstores, and I'm not sure that they have them even if they exist. Um, but at the end of my book, I actually try to offer a kind of um, example of what might be a core curriculum. Which is, hum which is genuinely humanistic, which is focused on issues like ethics, the imagination, and so forth, but does so from a multicultural um, kind of a, a background. 
I think it's possible. Interestingly, when I wrote that curriculum, it was just sort of, here's some examples. I wasn't trying to dictate for people. When I wrote it, I was really worried that I was going to get slammed for writing it. Like, ah, that curriculum sucks, and how could he come up with it? That's what you get at the end of the... And strangely, in the reviews, no one said anything about it. They seemed to think it was OK, or what have you. I don't know. There are many, many different ways that you could organize uh, a humanistic education around these particular themes. I'm more interested in the idea that one does do that rather than what the specifics on the ground look like. To me, it would be actually rather interesting if a variety of American institutions actually offered their own core curricula, which were different and really spoke to the idea that coming to this particular college is going to give you a different sort of education from what you get elsewhere. But instead, what you find at most institutions, Providence College is not really like this in some respects because it has a kind of core and has the Catholic tradition associated with it. If you come to the University of Maryland or Connecticut College or Duke University, I'm just picking places that I've been, it's the same sort of pick and choose curriculum you get anywhere else. And the, there's sort of no difference between going to Duke versus going to Conn College. I mean, the class sizes might be different and what your students are like are different. But the, as far as the curriculum is concerned, it's all the same choose your own adventure sort of curriculum. I, I don't think that works as well as a model in which there was genuine choice for students about what sort of education you thought was most valuable for you moving forward. Thanks so much. Um, lots to think about, very timely. I have just a quick comment and then a question. The comment is, uh, there's a great defense of the critical thinking strategy in Plato's Republic. Uh, when he encourages uh, his students or his listeners to study the liberal arts, in particular mathematics, he says, it's going to make you a really good general. And then he later he says, oh, and it's also going to help you identify uh, the transcendent. Mm -hmm. So there's a peculiar uh, tradition within the tradition of the humanities that sees skills-based defenses as certainly not ultimate, but certainly strategic yeah. and strategically useful mm -hmm. defenses. And that's maybe, int maybe an interesting thing to remember. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, I'd love to see how far you would go in the substantive defense of the humanities. Mm -hmm. So you, for example, Nussbaum, whom you quoted, I, she's, she cares a lot about sympathy, uh, that the humanities develop sympathy, and that's a very important character trait to develop, especially in the young. Uh, you mentioned self-reflection mm -hmm. uh, of various kinds. So I'm interested, how far can you go? Like, do you have 10, here's 10 substantive principles that the humanities develop. And one, one way of, or one reason one might want to push in that direction is there are, there are general things like sympathy. Mm -hmm. That's one way of taking your substantive mm -hmm. uh, defense of, of this kind of education. Mm -hmm. But there's a second, and that's geographic and temporal. And you've done a little bit of defense of a geographic mm -hmm. expansion, mm -hmm. not a temporal one, although I suspect you'd be in favor of that too. Yeah. But the question then would be, why? Why can't you develop sympathy and self-reflection right. by studying masterpieces all written within the last 100 years? Right. Uh, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's very thoughtful. First of all, I will, I will note that I, I think you're exactly right, that starting from antiquity, and here if we're talking about Plato, we're really actually talking about before the birth of what would be called the liberal arts, because this is a Roman term, so you wouldn't use that particular term. But for elite education from antiquity moving forward, there's always been this kind of jumble of rationales for why you should do it, right? And part of that has always been pragmatic. This is also true for the Renaissance humanists as well. They made this big deal about perfecting your character and being a good person and so forth. And this was their major pitch as far as why you should be educated in this kind of classical way. But at the same period of time, they lived during a period in which there were distinct pragmatic benefits to being trained in Latin and Greek that you could have certain jobs as a result of having that particular training. Being a notary, being a teacher, being a, a politician, um, in medicine, in law, these are areas in which grounding in the classical languages was necessary. So there's always going to be this kind of hodgepodge of rationales why you should study something. And I don't deny, this is why I also said in my talk, 
I'm not suggesting we should never talk about the skills that someone learns in a humanistic education, because obviously there are such skills and it's valuable. I'm merely saying we shouldn't only talk about those particular skills, and the skills shouldn't be the organizing principle. And that's especially the case because some of the skills that one is supposed to get from a humanistic education, I think, unfortunately bleed into other areas that are not humanistic. I could see, for example, a sociologist making a very profound argument suggesting that you can learn sympathy from studying sociology in the social sciences, or from political science as well, too. I have a hard time believing that the only conduit for sympathy is the humanities. Now, I do think that imaginative literature can kind of spark our imaginations and our sympathies in particular ways that are profoundly powerful, that may be very different from what, say, a sociology course can do. But I'm a little nervous about making claims about some sort of things that the humanities do that supposedly other subjects don't do. Because if you're going to make a claim that the humanities do something, and then someone from another discipline outside the humanities says, ah, oh, we do that too, you've now justified the idea that your program can be eliminated. Because if all you do is offer something that someone else offers, there's really no value for the subject at all. Now, as far as um, the great books going back more than 100 years, Babbitt would have made a very big deal about the idea that um, the, the kind of worldview of someone like Confucius or Buddha or Cicero or Plato was profoundly different from people who live in a world after Bacon and Rousseau. And that as a result, you can see a way of looking at the world by examining the classics from both the East and the West that you cannot see if you look at more contemporary literature. So I do think that uh, a broader temporal approach does get you at more variety than if you're only talking in the past hundred years or something like that. Um, it is also the case, I think, that if a text has survived for generation after generation after generation and people from a particular tradition have found it to be an especially valuable and therefore canonical text, that's probably a text you ought to take very seriously. And the older something is, the more fully it's likely to be kind of ensconced in that particular kind of environment. So again, I would like to see a kind of mix of contemporary and older and so forth as well, because I'm also worried about something I'm sure that you're concerned, or any teacher of the humanities is concerned about, is a kind of presentism, the idea that what's happened in the past is unimportant. The world today is so different, and therefore we can't learn from the past. That gets reinforced if you only pick literature or movies from the past 10 or 15 years and so forth. So I think that needs to be fought against as well. Lord, thank you for coming. I, I've really appreciated uh, your presentation here, uh, particularly your, your comments about institutions sort of having a confidence in what they propose and being willing to have something, you know, different or that stands out. So hopefully that's something we can accomplish here at Providence College. Um, the, I'm interested in your um, descri description of the benefit of studying the humanities and that it is about character development or I think this is your term also becoming well-rounded mm -hmm. in a certain sense. I'm wondering if um, you've considered uh, the humanities offering uh, wisdom and if you've uh, chosen not to present that or just what are your thoughts on no. uh, the humanities offering wisdom to a student? Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, I'd say about well-roundedness, I would say that's probably more associated with the liberal arts tradition as a whole as opposed to strictly the humanities, although here, things get complicated because in antiquity for Cicero, the studia humanitatis or the studies of humanity were the same as the liberal arts. It's actually in the Renaissance where they split off or partly split off and the humanities become narrower than they had been in antiquity. In antiquity, the humanities also included the sciences and so forth, things that we don't associate with that. So I would say this is more something associated with the, the liberal arts tradition as a whole. In regard to wisdom, um, I would note that um, Babbitt did kind of genuflect to Edmund Burke, who comes up with this phrase, the wisdom of the ages, um, as a way of offering for students a kind of sustenance for them to, to pick over in the course of their education about what this wisdom may actually be and where it may be located and in which traditions. And so he did genuinely believe that it would require a kind of wisdom on the part of an adult to recognize how to live one's life 
to the fullest or the best way one can. And that he thought also that in order to get that wisdom, that this wisdom was so important, in fact, that it was valuable to look at manifold traditions for examples of that wisdom. He was someone who was very much not only an ecumenical thinker, but he was kind of a, um, a lumper rather than a splitter, which makes him someone who's sort of un, uh, unfashionable in contemporary academia. He's someone who's interested in looking at correspondences between things. And he genuinely believed that there were correspondences between Confucianism, Buddhism, and Christianity that were especially valuable for students to examine because the idea that such differing traditions had come up with and valued similar views on the way to live your life was a suggestion that there is a wisdom of the ages, that there is a sense of human wisdom from manifold traditions that actually should lead us to think maybe they've hit on the best way to live one's life. Now that's ultimately up to the student himself or herself, but that's what they should be presented with. So I'm not bothered by the notion of an education in humanism is also a kind of search for wisdom. I just would be nervous of suggesting that I'm going to come to my class and you will get wisdom from me or something like that. I, I don't think that's gonna work. Instead, let's read some great texts together from various traditions and let's see if we can intuit together what the wisdom of the ages may be. Sure. Whoop. We got time for two more questions, I think. Looking around the room. No. Thank you again for your talk. I, I believe you have hit on something to talk about how we've allowed the social sciences to evaluate the humanities. And I'm going to ask you a question, which I'm sure you hate, which we often get. But what is my ROI? What is my return on investment to send my son or daughter to yeah. Providence College to study the humanities? Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And one thing that I would note also about the first part of the comment is one thing, and I don't know how much this is um, here, but I'm sure it's everywhere because it's the nature of accreditation, is that we have, at least at Maryland and at other institutions, have been at something called learning outcomes right? Uh, learning outcome, I forget what the LOA, I forget what the A stands for, right? And it's this sort of skills-based, what did students learn in your classes kind of thing. And everyone hates them, right? Because everyone knows it's a joke. And the idea that you're going to get a humanist to kind of come up like a social scientist and figure out how much learning was done in these particular categories, these skills-based categories and so forth. Well, that's what you get if you have no substance-based vision of what an education is. You get learning outcomes. That's what you get, right? And everyone hates them. My wife's a social scientist. She hates them too. She thinks them are a joke as well. No one takes that stuff seriously. It's just done for accreditation. But that, that's the vision of education that we're actually offering. If we do not offer a substance-based curriculum, then what we're saying is all students get out of this education is skills. And if that's the case, we might as well all do learning outcome assessments because that's the best way to do so. Now, as far as return on investment, one thing I would make clear is that I'm not trying to argue that everyone needs to be a humanities major. I'm merely arguing that as part of their higher education, everybody should have a strong humanistic component to their education. So that if someone ends up doing a humanities core in the way that I envision, and then ends up majoring in physics, I don't see a problem with that. I've got no problem with that. It doesn't matter to me at all. What I see as really worrying is that someone gets basically a kind of narrow vocational education that never deals with character development, that never deals with life's great questions, and then just goes off into the world. And we somehow believe that they're going to make the world a better place, even though they've never thought in any way, shape, or form about what it means to be a good person. Right? That's dangerous to society itself. And so I think, though, this is, we're getting away from return on investment, but I do think we're thinking about the, our culture and how our culture can survive, right? One of the things that we see, and I don't want to get too political about this, but I'm sure you can imagine uh, some examples, is that many of our contemporary political figures are, shall we say, not wonderful people, 
who seem like really great people who should be emulated. But shouldn't a society's leaders be people who are worthy of emulation in some way? Shouldn't they have reached this pinnacle as a result of this? Well, if we have a kind of education in which they are to, supposed to shunt aside all kinds of questions of character and focus only on sort of vocationalism, how are we going to assume we're going to have good leaders? How are we going to have a good culture? So to me, it's less about the individual return on investment and more about safeguarding the future of our culture itself, that everyone ought to have some sort of humanistic core to their own education that really looks at these questions in a serious way. And then whether they major in other subjects and so forth, that doesn't matter to me at all. I think there's way too much focus on what one's major is. As the, you know, when you tell people, oh, I'm in college now, their first question to you is, what's your major? Right? This is the first question, right? Well, for most of American higher education, there were no majors. They didn't exist until the very late 19th century. Right? Everyone took largely the same classes before the Civil War and so forth, because these classes and the content in those classes were seen as the conduits to living the good life. Right? To me, it seems like one reason why students tend to see general education as jumping through hoops is because it has no substance to it. Right? And if we provide that substance and we allow students to see that those kinds of classes can allow them to think about how they ought to live their lives, I think what they end up majoring in is, is, is neither here nor there. I want to take the last question, Professor Adler, and I'm, I'm going to ventriloquize on behalf of what I think maybe some of the students might think or might respond to this. And it goes something like this. They're going to say, you know, Professor Adler, I'd, I read 80 pages of something or other last week. I have to read, uh, you know, 100 pages of John Stuart Mill this week, and then next week, I don't know, I think we're doing Nietzsche or something. And I didn't really understand it. We, we didn't read the whole thing. You know, I moved along, and I, f I feel like I'm just on, a, on an intellectual conveyor belt where I sort of, like, grab a sample of something on my way past. How is this supposed to form my character? Mm -hmm. And, and so what I'm getting at with this question is I'm wondering whether your argument entails that we have to also study these texts in a certain way or in a certain mode and not just because like I could have 20 books on my bookshelf and I'll dip into them a little bit and, and forget about them and, and I don't think I've changed at all right. as right. a result of this. Yeah, okay, great, great, great questions. Two things I would say in regard to that, if I, if I can remember both as I'm going through my answer. One is that I do think it's true that there are different ways to study texts or to read with different levels of seriousness and that some of them will not really lead to the kind of um, self-reflection that I'm talking about. When you talk about the idea that the humanities could make you a better person, the, the obvious response to that is, well, there were some very highly cultivated Nazis. You know, so clearly, these are people who understood they knew about painters and some philosophy and so forth, and they were some of the most awful people you've ever seen before in your life. Similarly, at a much lower level, you could see some people on a faculty who know quite a bit about various texts, but are not necessarily such wonderful people if you talk about to them in their daily lives. But I would suggest that there are different ways of studying these texts. And one of the real problems about a humanistic education is it is so tied up in ideas of um, class um, that, and elitism, that oftentimes people will take these subjects not because they really have this thirst to understand the answers to life's great questions, but because it looks fancy. You know, um, so oftentimes if someone asks me, what do you do for a living, and I say I'm a classics professor, well the first question you'll get is, most of the time is what's a classics professor, what are the classics, that happens a lot. But when you tell them that, you say it's Latin and Greek, oftentimes they go like, ooh, oh, that's very fancy or something. They don't know anything about it, but it, there's a kind of cachet associated with it because of the subject, we dimly understood that it was so important in earlier American higher education. That, I think, actually gets in the way of studying these texts in the kind of manner that I'm talking about. So I would say that that's one issue that you've brought up. The second, though, is that I would say that we underplay the degree to which what we read ends up having an impact on our imaginations and the way that we see the world. 
One thing that's really strange is that if you look out today at kind of fights over education, in primary and secondary school, there are these very unpleasant but valuable fights that people are having about the curriculum. Should students be reading Homer's Odyssey in ninth grade, or should they be reading young adult fiction? And people get into these huge fights about this, almost fist fights about this stuff, with a kind of recognition that what you read has this huge impact on how you end up seeing the world, right? And then suddenly when people get to college and they just say, ah, just take whatever courses you want, it doesn't really make any difference. Just take a humanities class. It could be comic books or it could be Homer, it doesn't really matter. Suddenly you get to this level and people just totally underplay the role of the imagination in life. This is something that advertisers don't do. If you look at advertising, very seldom do you see a television advertisement in which someone just says, this is the best car and here's why. It has the best uh, uh, tires, it has the best engine, and so that's not, it's normally Matthew McConaughey driving shirtless at night in some Lincoln or something like that, and you're, now, you'd have to be an idiot to think that if you bought a Lincoln, you're going to look exactly like Matthew McConaughey shirtless driving at night, but advertisers recognize that even with something as stupid as a Lincoln commercial, it has an effect on your brain and the way that you see the world. If a Lincoln commercial can do that, such that you might actually buy a Lincoln, just imagine what Homer can do. Just imagine what Confucius can do. So I don't, I wouldn't, even when we try to read these things, they say, I don't really fully understand it and so forth, they end up shaping our worldviews in ways that we don't even necessarily recognize. For instance, when I was in middle school, we all read To Kill a Mockingbird, which I would call a good book, not a great book, but a good book. I still think it's probably affected my vision of what is, what is justice and what it means to treat other people with dignity and respect in ways that I can't even imagine because I read that when I was a younger person. So one can imagine that that has this effect. It's not always going to fit. It's not always going to work. Sometimes you just sort of read, you know, James Joyce's Ulysses and say, like, my God, what in the Lord's name was that? I got nothing from it. But oftentimes it's going to seep into your brain in particular ways and have an effect on the way that you view the world. So what we teach matters, not just how we teach, what we teach matters.